We brought him in for a little preseason means test last week. We black booked the Giants. We forgot to back them. Hello, David <laughs> King. Welcome. Oh, not all of us forgot. Oh, right. <laughs> Morning, I actually Jared. forgot to even dip them. <laughs> yeah. I got, got a couple of days and I thought, oh, hang on, they were my black book specials. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you've black booked them and the Saints this year. I can't concentrate on these things. Yeah, I know. I have. Yeah, they're, they're two in my black book. Yeah, well. You've been you've been distracted this week with the cricket and the horse racing, and so it's good to have you back. Just zero right in. Good now. to have you back. All right, every means test starts with a king's gambit. This is for Victoria Police, made for more. Search police careers. Well, everywhere I look around footy, when it, whenever there's change, it, it's changed back to the way that Damien Hardwick initially started. It, it, what about 2017? After the failure of 2016. They played this this new way of football that 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 was explosive, that was aggressive, that was a turnover based plan that said, "Okay, you, you're going to get your turn with the footy. It's going to be a high turnover brand. We're going to be aggressive. You, you're going to get your chance to score against them, and they're going to back themselves as a system to stand up, usually with one or two p's behind the ball." And, and it revolutionised the game. And I think when you look across the competition right now. The Dimmer Hardwick plan is everywhere. Now, there's there's different components and different layers added by different coaches. And I look at GWS and I look exactly what's happened there. It is is Dimmer's plan on steroids. They've been they've been diminated for one of a better term, Dim, uh, Jared. So I, I think his plan at the Suns is is slightly different to what it was at Richmond, but they've got a better clearance team there than what they probably had at Richmond. But they, Richmond were always pretty good when it got to the pointy end of the year. Guys like Presti really um, stood tall. So I think when you look at Collingwood, the, the, you know, Craig McRae and, and Justin Leppage took some of that intel, a lot of that intel, over, over to the Pies. You'd want a good reason not to be looking at this model and stealing components and what works for you, whether it's 50%, 60%, 20%, whatever level it is, but we saw the reverse. So we saw a team go from the, the, the Harbick model to an Uze model. Now it's it's day one. It's first day of school stuff, right? So we're not making any great um, statements about them, but it looks so drastically different. And, and obviously it's going to be clunky, but a lot longer kicking to centre-half forward to sort of 40 out from goal – and I'm thinking that that that's just not going to work. Um, so the high handball, high aggression, high octane brand, I think GWS have taken to a new level. Collingwood, Collingwood early last season were just ridiculously good. Um, couldn't hold it for the whole year. A few injuries impacted that sort of thing. But I think when you look at the Damien Harwick model, it's it's taking over footy. Do, do you agree with that? The dimination of the football. Dimination. Do you, do you see it? Do you agree with that? Tell just tell me how that relates to the Suns, where he actually is, and what we saw on Saturday. Wow, well, that you don't see it just yet. It's one week, and and as I said, that you look at the way teams score and the way they're able to move the ball. And he's probably been, he's probably been um, not gifted's the wrong word, but but enjoys the luxury of of guys like Anderson and Rowell and Miller at clearance that he hasn't had. So the ball movement pattern won't be as much slings off of half back or other defensive half because they'll start with the ball more often than not. So maybe maybe they have to change slightly. And maybe that's a that's something that the that, that Damien will tweak with over the next few weeks. I don't think that they'll have a fifty fifty year in my opinion. But the next you know, I said it said it two weeks ago, I think they're winning a flag within three years. Because he does have eighty percent of the of the of the squad there to take him to a premiership. And we can go through the names at any stage you like. Because if you don't have 80%, you're not winning in three. Because how, how many, you need, you're going to have to find four or five players. That's fine. You can't find 12 in the next you know, short period to get that, get that done. I think it gets easier uh, to acquire players if you've got a team that's charging like they are. What a great sell it would be right now to, a, to an uncontracted, what are you looking for? You're looking for a... Say you're looking for a centre half forward. Imagine the sell you could give to that centre half forward right now. Here's our midfield. Did you see the game of Raoul on the weekend? He's going to be giving it to Anderson, who's going to be kicking it to you. Like we're going to get opportunity. We're going to play this brand. We're going to dominate 
football on the Gold Coast. We, we're going to become a serious football club. Um, so th- I think it's easy for them now to acquire free agents. Uh, I think it'll be easier for for them to, to play more and more exciting football as they go because the rewards are coming now for this group that have really been starved of uh, four points. They've worked hard for everything. And, and I'm, I just think when you – so they, they're doing it slightly differently at the moment because they still find themselves. But you look at GWS. That to me, that's that's the model. That's that's I think the full aggression, high level talent, gut runners. He's got them now to a level of fitness and that repeat speed we keep talking about, or they keep talking about. Um, that, that it's it's absolutely it's absolutely in sync with the way they want to play. Yep, the game has been dominated. The King's Gambits for Victoria Police looking for a career that gives you more. Search police careers, Victoria Police made for more. All right. So we've got lots of categories to work through. Um, it's it, like the texts are just pouring through. So I well, just I thought we might struggle today. No, no. It's, it's a proper Monday. Jeez. It's a proper Monday. Um, and th- there's a hot debate around Collingwood and how far you want to extrapolate that performance. So... I've put the Giants straight into PFI, so we'll get to them. But where do you want to come at Collingwood? So by popular demand, we'll make Collingwood the big issue and how far you want to read into first up defeat from the premiums. Well, everyone's going to want to jump at uh, at shadows. I'm not worried if I'm Collingwood. I I don't think they had their their best outing. Uh, It's tough to go on the road and, and... I did, some, I did some numbers, so this is going to hold for Carlton as well. Yep. Okay. So let's just let's just start with these numbers. So any form of interstate travel, last season, seventy-one wins, ninety-eight losses on the road. So you're a forty percent chance of winning on the road. When you travel, you're a forty percent chance. Okay. If you play a top eight team, if you travel to play a top eight team, you're a, you're a twenty-seven percent chance of winning. So one in four. So you go from one in two and a half to one in four. If you play a top four team last year, you're a one in seven chance of winning. So these are the these are the I keep talking about playing like types. Yeah. If you're playing a like type, so everyone thinks that Collingwood and GWS are going to be in a similar part of the ladder. We all, we've all got them in the top four. So it's hard to go to their home turf and get and get the four points. So Carlton, we'll get to Carlton later. That that is an enormous win. No one's doing that. No one's done that for for twenty odd games. So put it into context, one in seven, and they've done that round round zero. First hit out for the year, they go and do something that is done 15% of the time. So Collingwood, I don't – yeah, they weren't favourites for the game. So everyone's jumping on them. Oh, they, they should have, I think there's holes down back. I think the loss of Murphy is 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 evident for all to see. They looked they – looked, they looked haphazard. They looked lost down back. They didn't defend nor to – 30 as well as what they have in the past. They got over aggressive and had one of those days where Darcy Moore just looked lost. Wherever they go, they just look lost. Now, they smashed them. I, I was surprised uh, by the damage from, from clearance that the Giants were able to put to them. They scored they scored 50 points from clearance, four goals from centre bounce clearance. So, so when you look at the centre bounces, I, I just don't understand. This is one of my great frustrations. So centre bounce ruck work has a major impact on centre bounce clearances. So the hit out at a centre bounce, if you get a hit out to advantage, you should get the clearance. Hit outs at centre bounce is 26 to 5. Hit outs to advantage, 11 to 2. Yet they lost the clearances. So how, how, how does that happen? Like, they got good players in there. You know, Dacos going through there. It's not surprising to me they sub Mitchell. He had a long way back to come into those come, come into those uh, clearance opportunities, and it probably impacted his ability to get his hands on the ball. He's, they were they were out muscled regularly. To go, he gave away some free kicks. He was he was okay in the middle, but he wasn't he wasn't his normal powerful self. So Green Green monstered them in there. Ward when he was in there at the start. Um, Kelly's just a different a different asset in there. So I, I think there's enormous scope for improvement from their clearance game. Um, so I'm not I'm not worried about that. I'm probably worried. I'm probably worried about the the investment in the in the in the game. 
What the Giants do is they challenge you to be 100% invested in every facet. Now, I used to talk about the Sydney Swans giving you an audit. And when there was a component of your game that was poor, they'd drive a wedge into that component and, and tactically go after that area. And, and John Longmire is a great coach for being able to do that. I, I think what the Giants are doing with the way they play, everyone's an attacker, everyone's a defender. They go. They invest so heavily in whatever component of the game it is, it, it's overwhelming. So when they win the ball in the back half, everyone's a runner. I'm going to show a clip on Wednesday night where the centre half back and the full back are on their bike and going. Now you just don't see that. Yep. So there's a wave of there's a wave of eight, ten, twelve coming out of the back line. So they call it the tsunami, right? And it's a it's a bygone era that we started. Jared Healy started that discussion, but it is the tsunami mark too, and they are gone. And if you have one lazy forward or two lazy forwards, that's enough. They'll break you. And they step through the midfield and then they have players out the back. So they were challenged to to to, to test their level of investment on the weekend, Colin. And I think that they failed that. But there's gonna be a there's gonna be a lot of teams fail that against the Giants. So they played the hottest team right now on their home turf and were just short of their investment levels for me and just short of the mark at clearance, particularly centre bounds clearance. Uh, I was trying to figure out which category for Carlton. I've probably been gazumped because here's how one of our Carlton devotees has broken up the categories. The Gabba was like the Academy Awards, Kingy. Carlton went from a horror show to Best Picture winner. Best Supporting Actor went to Harry Mackay. Best Costume Design went to the Blues Brothers in the crowd. Best Sound went to the Carlton Supporters of the Ground. Best Original Song, We Are the Navy Blues. Best Director, Michael Voss. Best live action short film, Carlton's Third Quarter. Best visual effects, Mackay's Goal. <laughs> not bad, not bad. We had, uh, well, it was perfect for crunch time, sort of the full emotive response to what had happened on Friday night. Now a little bit cold and analytical. What have you dug into on the Carlton front? I think Brisbane would look at this game and say, gee whiz, we've left a few scores on the shelf. But momentum's the, the one, isn't it? And when you get momentum, you've got to get it on the scoreboard. And that's what Carlton did. And I think we look at Charlie Kerno and, and he's everything that they needed him to be on the weekend. That, that, those four goals in sort of 20 minutes of footy, everything he touched turned to gold. He, he crumbed his own ball uh, inside the forward 50. And he was a match-up headache. It's a match-up disaster. The one thing on, on review, looking at it again, I never really saw, until the absolute last play of the game, Never really saw Harry and Charlie competing against each other in the air. So, so there's there's a real connection there and a, and a symmetry that um, is next level. So that was terrific. And then I think the use of Kennedy as a deep forward, you know, and then Cripps as that that third tall forward. And I've been crying out to see who that's going to be. I think that's a real win for Michael Voss. I think that's that's a tactic or a a strategy that he could go to. And now, I'll show vision later in the week um, of of what that did. I mean, he was able to he was able to, to get himself a mark and a goal inside the forward fifty there, Crips at the start of the last, I think it was. But he was involved in more than that, and because he's such a presence down there and a big figure, his opponent wouldn't leave him to then go and support on Mackay and 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 Kerno. So I, I think that player that can hold a defender or engage a defender is incredibly valuable to Carlton. Probably more valuable than than we give it credit for. I, I was throwing up the idea of maybe a McGovern having to go forward just to have that threat that, that you can be a third man in marker or you can you can at least hold your opponent so the other two can go to work. So to me, that was a big win from the coach's box uh, for Vossi. But if you play that game, yeah, we, we don't. We play it once and we move on and we're, and we're wrapped for Carlton. As I said, it's a huge win. You beat a top four team on the road last year, one in every seven opportunities. So to do it first up, massive win. Massive win. And probably a, a win that, 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 that given what we know Carlton are going to be once they get this momentum rolling, powerful football club, um, huge supporter base, it can take them anywhere. Back half of last year, phenomenal, unstoppable. To do this early in the year is huge. And then they've still got so much star factor to come back. 
Wittering and Walsh. I mean, we, uh, Martin. I mean, Martin's that probably a little bit that guy I'm talking about with Cripps. So if, if you if you can get those magnets in and how you bring them back in and you just got to you just got to cross your fingers for no re, uh, recurrences or anything like that, but bring them back in and things are starting to look pretty good for the Blues. So let's not leave that game. Let, let's do the open question which sits over the Brisbane Lions and whether this is a, a pattern of behaviour for them. How have you uh, how have you analysed what happened with the Lions? Yeah, I think I think sometimes that your on field leaders and your coaches' box have to be absolutely in sync. So when the game's in the balance, five point gap, two minutes thirty seven on the clock, boundary throw in Carlton's forward line, that's a that's a moment where the leaders, whether they're on or off field, have to take control, and and it's not something you can make up in the moment. Now, I know that they train for these things. I know they do situational training, but I still don't see it. So for me, their best loose man, you throw a loose man behind the ball and you put him somewhere near the the drop zone, the likely drop zone. It's usually, if the ball's more than 50 metres from goal, it's somewhere 10 to 15 from goal. And you just track basically a kick and a quarter, kick and a half from the play. If it's within a kick, you go somewhere near the biggest dangers. And the biggest dangers are Kurnow Mackay. So when when there's a set stoppage, you get an opportunity, in my opinion, to get some. It used to be Gunston. He's not there anymore. So I think their best loose man is Joe Danaher, because he can travel. He can he can get to contest. He can, he's a he's a big presence. He can outmark smaller opponents, or he can be a great third man in spoiler. So I I would be plonking him in the dr- likely drop zone or slightly behind that. Yep. On the on the other place. They didn't do that. That's fine if you go on and win the game. You do whatever you want to do. But if you lose, you get questioned. If you win, no one says anything. That's footy. That's that's winning and losing. That's life, right? They left Kerno and they left Mackay one-on-one for that last 100 seconds. And I think the loss is on them. Now, they can argue that that's fine. They ended up with, they ended up with a 7v6. They had seven Carlton forwards and six Brisbane defenders in that last mad scramble that was the last 60 seconds or so. I'm just showing you the vision. We've seen it. So they'll study this. They'll they'll know there's a flaw there. But it's it's still the same topic. They hate the discussion. I I understand they hate the discussion. But until we see change, we can't can't endure. So I think they need to look at the use of Dan Hearn. Now, to do that, there's a fair bit of management's got to go into your last 20 minutes of footy because you've got to make sure that McInerney's on the field so that Joe can go back, that he's not stuck as the ruckman, all those sorts of things. So this is not something you can make up on the run. Yep. Um, so I think they've got a challenge. You know, they've, they've got to finish top two to win the flag. And, and they've dropped the game at home. So this is all the talking point of the preseason. Was, was last year their year or is this year their year? But it's a, it's a, it's a big loss. And everyone will say, oh, you read too much into it. We haven't even got go- – we haven't even had round one yet. You, you, you're going too far. But but their, their challenge is – and the teams that don't have the MCG as their home venue have to finish top two. Um, or I should say interstate teams. And it's unfair for them, but that's the reality of where the grand finals played. So you've got to finish top two. So it's a, it's a big kick in the guts early. And out of that game, the clear worst bits were the two knee injuries to Kitty Coleman, and Sam Doherty. Yeah. So maybe one at a time. When we sat on crunch time, we had, there was no reason to think that was going to be Doherty's fate. It no. just landed. It was a hammer blow right across footy when that landed later on the Saturday. Yeah. So you, you lose leadership. You lose. You lose um, that really calming effect on the group. When the ball's in Doherty's hands, it, it's it's a you know the things are going to be done as they should. He's going to organise traffic around him, whether he's on ball or he's behind the ball. Um, so that it's a big loss. It's just an it just puts an extra load on those other leaders. You know, without we doing there at the moment, now no doc. So the other guys have to do more. They have to think more about the game rather than their own game. So that that's a that's a challenge in the short term, but in the long term, it's it's a it's a very important magnet that's not going to be utilised this year. Keep saying it. Helps your best player in AFL footy. Yep. Particularly when we get to September. He ain't going to be there. It's a big loss. It's not as big a loss as Kitty Coleman. No. Kitty Coleman's massive because he's their, 
He's their wild card. He's their free wheeler. He's the guy that I spoke to Chris Fagan in the offseason. Can you get this guy in the midfield? Because you don't have this guy. You don't have this midfielder. You don't have the angles that can that can smack the ball 50 metres in a heartbeat. It gets there quick when Kitty kicks the ball. Um, so who plays halfback now? You know, and everyone says, oh, well, we're just going to play McKenna. McK- McKenna's not. He's nowhere near that bracket. And he's nowhere near a Dane Zorko bracket going to halfback. Oh, that's what that's what I'd be doing. I'd be putting Zorko back and maintaining Flair, because if you if you haven't got Flair, we talked about this. Logic gets you A to B, and imagination gets you everywhere. If you haven't got imagination out of your back line, you don't score anymore. You just don't score. So uh, it's a it's a it's a horrible loss for both these two teams. Um, but that that's that's footy. You got to dust yourself off and go again. That's the worst bits from the weekend, those injuries to Coleman and Doherty. The pressure index is Melbourne. They, they've lived the pressure index even when it was inactive across the off-season. Um, they put themselves in an environment of their own making, and the only way through that early in the season is wins out on the field. Uh, they, they were disappointing against Sydney. Now, you can run whatever mitigation you like through that, but what it does do is it, it puts a huge bounty on this game against the Bulldogs. Is Their draw at the start of the season was Sydney and Sydney. Tough. Bulldogs, who are desperate to fly the gates. They have a, quite the rivalry together. Melbourne's had the wood on them. Hawthorne, and then they play both Adelaide teams at Adelaide Oval and Brisbane. So the gateway to one and five is losing to the Bulldogs. That they're squarely in the pressure index at the start of the season, just to fight their way through it and to make sure that they're balanced as they hit the core of the season. Yeah. So you, where, where you invest your energy, you have to be strong. It has to be, it has to be not eight out of 10. It's got to be 10 out of 10. It's got to be your point of difference. So their point of difference and, and the same words come out of their, their mouths every time you ask them, what, what's your point of difference? Who are you? What's your personality as a footy team? Contest and defense. Well, that, that, both those areas fell apart on the weekend. Now, it's one game, I, I understand. And the conditions were poor, so they didn't get any bang for buck when they went forward. But they got hammered at contest. And Isaac Heaney, who hasn't been a clearance player, he hasn't. He hasn't been a clearance. Because Swans haven't been a clearance team for so long. They haven't been a, a contested footy team. And, and, and Heaney has, what, he had 13 clearances. 13 against, against Melbourne, who had Viney, Petrarca, Oliver, like guys that you just go, oh, that, that Melbourne are going to win that area. It's sort of, it's too simplistic to just tick that off. But going to that game, you think, okay, it's Swan's ball movement versus Melbourne's ability to just punish and bash and crash and, and, and beat you into submission. Well, they didn't have that. So if they don't get that back, it won't matter what else you talk about. It won't matter about how their forward line you know, leaves a few scores on the, on the deck. It, it won't really matter whether it's Petty or Pickett or Fritch. If they cannot dominate supply, and we did it the other day, we did the numbers. If, they, if They're only a 50-50 team if they lose inside 50s. If they win inside 50s, they're, they're an 80% chance of winning the game. They're an 80-20 team. So they've got to get that back. It, it's as simple as that. They've got to be, they've got to be tougher. They've got to be harder. They've got to lean on their leaders again. And they've been so good, but they're going to have to go again. This is, I feel like it's about their third challenge for the off season. And they play one game. Mm. I feel like I mean, this is the stress of the, of the situation. It's draining. So unless they can start to get some reward, Jared, you're right. The season will just fall away. So that, this is a huge opportunity this week. Just correct it. Shut everyone up. This is who we are. You know what we're about. And we come and we bash the dogs. Yeah. Oh, I th- it's much less about the external and much more about the internal for them. As I think you, these sorts of, you live the discontent of an off season in the way that they have. And it's really all about, well, well, who are we going into this season? And do we galvanize or do we fracture? Oh, I think the likes of Luke Hodge and Phil Davis have been excellent on this. And they're just a watching brief as you can have faith that they'll galvanize and they'll be right. Or this this setup, if they don't get it right at the start of the season, can spiral. And then, so I thought Christian Petrarca was excellent with Gary and Tim this yeah, morning yeah, talking about the Oliver scenario. So this is that they have both strains of this running together. Um, but this is as mature an insight as we've had out of Melbourne thus far. 
unbelievable, and I love that honesty. And and, and it does just it does just I think make us all look look at yeah. What if he was your son? What if he was your brother, Clayton? How, how would you look at it? Yeah, you know, it does bring it back to the real. Uh, real perspective, if you like. So, oh, well, well said, well done, great interview. Um, but to keep it to footy, if if Christian doesn't get his hands on the ball, they don't score. So if he doesn't get it somewhere near Bailey Fritch to put the icing on the cake, they they don't score. Like that second half, I, I've never seen Max Gorn have as little impact in a game in a half of football. But Max is Max is the most important man in the game. He's the unstoppable force. If he's up and rolling and doing his his tap work and his follow-up work and his contested marking, he's the best we have in the game that's north of 195 centimetres. Yep. Unsighted in the second half. So that to me, that's their biggest challenge, is how do we support Max? How do we get Max back to being the dominant presence? And then, obviously, Oliver's going to take a couple more weeks. So in that, that intermediate bracket, who's going to step up? I think the Salem role is interesting. Salem as a clearance player is a bust for me. Salem as a kicker, first receive, perfect. perfect. Exactly what you want. So is he a half forward that rolls up to a stoppage or is he a centre bounce midfielder? I think he's a half forward that rolls up. I just think that, that there's a tweak there that needs to be made because he's too often he's the hit-to player. You don't want him in the in tight in the traffic. You need him to be in the in a little bit of space, making making the elite um, kicking skills stand out and actually separate games. I mean, so that, to me, there's a few little things they'll work on. Um, their forward line is, is all the chat, but for me, it's not really their forward lines; their mids. The other way, so pop quiz. We love a good pop quiz. I do love a pop quiz. All right. So, Lee, what is your pop quiz out, so, out of opening round? Right. Up. So I think the biggest change in our game in the last couple of years, and we called it the Leg Drivers Association, the old LDA, yep. right? <laughs> so guys that are prepared to embrace tackle and get through and break tackles. Brutes. Brutes that get through, that either make you miss totally with a step or two uh, or just go straight through a tackle. And then you're f- through that first line of defence and then the game gets you in a bit of space and you can become seriously effective with the footy. So last year, Right. Let's just start with last year before we come to this year. Yep. Any idea who the top tackle breaker in the competition would have been? I'll so give you a clue. Brutes. I'll so, give you a clue. Yeah, I would go the guys of Petrarca and Horn Francis. Very good. That's, yeah, those that style of player. Well, Petrarca was sixth with 33. Horn Francis was third with 41. John Newcomb was the number one tackle breaker in the game last year with yep. 44. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's that's piercing through, out front of stoppage, you're away and gone, 44 times. So it was Newcomb, Rayner, Horn Francis, Chad Warner, Warple, Petrarca, Dustin Martin, Brayshaw, Bailey Butters. I mean, they're, they're, they're seriously handy players um, that, that then give it to the weapons on the outside. So early, very early days, very, very early days. We've only had – Four games, but I just, I just thought it was evident that McCluggage is now in there. Petrarca's still in there. Will Powell, Gold Coast Football Club, Jerry, they, they're going to now start to do this sort of stuff. We saw Rao being Matty Rao. Um, I think he had one or two on the weekend. Cripps to Goey. So the, 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 for me, the game is sh- is really seriously shifting to these to this asset. So you've got to come with it. You've got to, you've got to not succumb to pressure. And, and I think that's why we're having more ball ups in the game, because players are, are trying to break the tackle. And if they can't, they pop a little handball to someone who's going to get tackled, and the game stops. Start again. Let's try it again. Um, so I, that's my opinion as to why I think the game is now having more ball ups than ever. But if you don't have tackle breakers, you've got to start developing them. Yep. If you want to go in the midfield, you've got to be able to break a tackle. Chad Warner's presence in that list is um, is significant. Yeah. Had a, had a sneaky good year without it being a great year last yeah. year. I think he came top half a dozen there, best and fairest. So uh, yeah, he, he's he was good again the other night. Big a big uh, one step goal from fifty two, fifty three. But when they went whack at the start of the last quarter, he was instrumental in all of that, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was very good. Oh, look, the the Heaney moves a very interesting one. How, how do you think Heaney will finish the year as a midfielder? 
That's a good question. So Jason had sent through his snap judgment. Isaac Heaney is a midfielder first and a forward second. Keep him in the game, not idle in the forward pocket. We love the he man, JC in Pottsville. So I think they'll use Parker forward when he comes back. He's a very good half forward. He's he's strong over, overhead. He's a little bit. He's 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 always had that ability to have a three goal game. You know, a two or three goal game. I think he'll start forward. The abuse of Papley and Heaney is something we're going to track. Um, and obviously they've got Mills to come back. So things are going to get really rosy for the Sydney Swans in the back half of the season. They didn't get much out of their tall forwards and still found a way to score. Um, they, they were imp- seriously impressive. And, and Nick Blakey, I mean, he's just playing a different game, isn't he? Yes. He, yes. He, I, don't know what, I, I don't know what he's going to do, you but it's going to be good. one of him, don't you? Yeah. And he's one of one, the way he does it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're over-indexed on the Swans, and you'd have every reason I to know. believe in it. I am. I'm, I, I was originally a Swan supporter, Jared. It's hard to shake. <laughs> what could we learn around the northern states from this weekend? That's part of the exposure. It was to create something for the northern states that the AFL had never done before. And it's a bit lost on people in Victoria, which I totally get, but it services a a broader perspective. You spent days in Sydney observing both teams there. What what did you feel like you learnt? Well, you you probably see it in in real terms, what it does, the cost of living in Sydney, what it it does to football clubs. And it's easy to dismiss. And, and, And I've probably overlooked it a little bit in the past because in the back of your mind, you think, oh, that money's just gone to Lance Franklin. Yeah, that money in yeah, it's just been shuffled around. They're still paying those other guys the same, and it just jumps onto Lance's contract or it enables them to go after free agents like Tippett and all those sorts of things, right? But when you when you see it, uh, what it does to not, let's let's just leave the players aside for a moment. Yep. When you see what it does to the football club, so say so the assistant coaches, they get paid the same at Sydney what the, and and GWS as what they would at Collingwood, Carlton, Fremantle. Adelaide. It'd be roughly the same. It'd be small margin stuff. But the cost of living smashes them. Most of those guys haven't been able to move there. Are either, are either starting from a, a, a Sydney base. The, the Swans have got half of GWS's old assistants or players and, and Sydney have got – you know, it's, it, just, it just flips. It just flips. They basically um, move 10 kilometres down the road. So to get someone from – Interstate to come to there is difficult because most of these assistant coaches have left their families where they've where they're currently located. So whether they're in Melbourne or in Adelaide or wherever, and then they've made very sort of temporary uh, accommodation. Some out of vans, some out of shared accommodation, some out of not ideal setups. Far from ideal, just because of cost of living. So I think it seriously impacts their ability to get intelligence into their footy club. Now, I'm not talking about the guys that are there now. They, they, they're clearly happy with them. Both clubs are clearly thrilled with them. But in a competitive market, that's that's a massive disadvantage. To, you, know, look, you look at some of the, the, the pit crew from from other clubs and you go, wow, well, have a look at that. You know, the, 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 the top liners that are there. Now, you can go and, you can go and pay over and blow your, your soft cap away and, and, and again – pay more as a football club and then we'll say, why are we giving GWS this extra money if they're just spending it on the assistant coaches? But I do think it's it's a real discussion. I just think that it, the AFL needs to come to become one of the greatest property um, owners in the land. Property owners? Well, I think the way through it is to is – to, remember we used to have Breakfast Point and all the players used to stay there. The guys that are on AFL – average wage or below. So say the guys are first, second, third year contracts, they have to bunk in together. They have to be, they have to be supported in a way. Um, so I think we need to look at this from a, from a player point of view and, and, a, and an assistant coaching or, or a football staffing point of view to, to, to mitigate the advantages that other teams have over those northern states. And I know that's not popular. The same people say, what are you talking about? It has a twofold effect. It'd be great for the AFL because it does future proof you in terms of finance. You know, if the if the like, heaven forbid, if something again happened like COVID, then you do have assets everywhere. It's not just Marvel Stadium. Um, and I I do think down the track you could look at it just being a, an asset that the clubs could use. All clubs could use. You might end up with some in Perth. You might end up with some you know 
in, in I don't know whether you need to bother in, in Adelaide really, but it, certainly in Brisbane, Gold Coast, um, Sydney, they should they should have residences. They really should, and and it'd be an easy way to fix what's been an age old problem. Bit of frat housing. It works. I mean, it, it has always worked, doesn't it? I mean, we used to have that way back when when we had players come from the country to. Yeah, I'm talking the nineties and, and it worked. But I just I really think that um you have you have to accept that it's an advantage or it's a disadvantage for these teams. It's not necessarily an advantage for others, but it is a disadvantage. If you have a look at where these assistant coaches are coming from and and, and how they're how they're housed or where they're living, it is it is a disadvantage for them to be at their absolute best. The recruiting departments aren't even there. Their list managers aren't always around. I mean, you go to Collingwood, they can walk out and watch them train. They can go and have a coffee with the players. They can go. There's so many things they can do that build relationships, build a football club that they don't necessarily have. Yeah, and it is it is absolutely hard to get an assistant coach that you want out of a heartland like Victoria to move to one of the two northern states. It's hard to cherry pick to target and to succeed. On that front, in the setup, it I think is. That's really clear. Yeah. So I, I think the the way out of it is is housing. They could, they could easily do it. We got we got we got a billion dollars to spend, haven't we, on game development? How about we just equalise things first before we worry about that? There was that alarming moment last year at the end of the season where the fellow who'd put together our seedings every week and just lined them up. Oh, as no. That that was a bit. That these live in isolation. Oh. <laughs> They're not supposed to be for scrutiny. <laughs> Yours look really poor too, by the way. Only the eight teams who have played are <laughs> Were eligible. You embarrassed here. At yours, no. never, <laughs> never wavered on Collingwood <laughs> until the very end. Until- <laughs> <laughs> four. Who's at four? Uh, Brisbane for me. Same uh, for me. Are they the twenty-four minutes at the start? Oh. I, I'm not wiping that from the memory. So good. And Three. As soon as they learn to put Dan Air behind the ball, they'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, Sydney three for me. I oh, thought they were very, very good. They were. They were. I've got Collingwood at three because I just couldn't have a set of scenes without Collingwood in them. Notwithstanding, they're a bit on the Who have you left side. out? Well, I've left Sydney out. Which oh, will cr- no, I've got a play in game. You know oh, how I work. <laughs> Collingwood plays Sydney. Winners <laughs> in, go. loses out. Oh, Two? Two GWS for me. I thought uh, outstanding, brilliant pattern of football and, and took. Collingwood to the cleaners in, in a few facets, but it was at home. Giants are two for me. You've copied my work. One. <laughs> the, 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 the Blues, fantastic victory. A, a victory you don't often see. As we said, beating a top four team on their home turf happens one in every seven. So well done to the Blues. Carlton are the one seed. What a beautiful thing. Uh, it's theirs to defend. The seedings for tyre power. Think safety this month. Get the five-minute tyre safety check at your local tyre power. All right, the first means test is away. Now we get the proper look at it with all 18 teams. Good on you, G. It's stacked this coming round. A lot of fun.